If we could talk to the animals, learn all their languages, maybe take an animal degree. If I conferred with our furry friends, man to animal, think of the amazing repartee. If I could walk with the animals, talk with the animals, grunt and squeak and squawk with the animals, and they could talk to me. Hello and welcome to Pet Watch, a monthly program about the Williamson County Animal Control and Adoption Center. I'm Debbie Sims and I'll be your host today. And my special guest is Amber Mears, who works at our shelter. Good morning, Amber. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Amber is our rescue coordinator, and that is a big title that covers a lot of the different things. Um, but in a nutshell, tell me what rescue coordinator does at the shelter. Um, I oversee all their dogs and cats that go to any kind of rescue, whether it be transports or individual rescue groups throughout the state. I think a lot of people think that uh, we only uh, adopt animals out to individuals who happen to come into the shelter looking for them but mm -hmm. it's a lot bigger than that and it takes uh, connections with a number of different organizations to make a rescue or an adoption which to me are the same thing yeah <laughs> uh, a rescue uh, if it goes to another rescue group is an it does result in an adoption yes so they're all the same to you <laughs> yes ma'am uh, um, when animals come into our shelter, what is your role, uh, your immediate role, if a, a new, say a new dog comes in through intake, what is, how do you look at that dog as, in your role as rescue coordinator? Um, if it's an owner surrendered dog, then that's something I can look at and say immediately if I want it to go to a rescue wagon or a certain rescue group that is breed specific, or if it's something that they wouldn't accept, I could say we would just save it and use it for our own adoption. Okay, so you kind of take a look and say, um, it's a Great Pyrenees, mm -hmm. uh, we have those a lot yes. come in the shelter. Uh, I saw one this morning when I was over there. Uh, you have one of those, you in your mind know that there are groups that, that love to take that dog and yes. will take a, upon themselves to get that dog a final mm -hmm. home. So that's one less dog that, that we have to find a home for. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I guess it's good. All these <laughs> people are good. helping us, right? Yes. Because we can't do it all ourselves. Um, what are other rescue groups looking for? Are they specific to a certain breed sometimes? We have some breed specific. Um, and then we have also rescues that just take smaller dogs and we have rescues that only want bigger dogs. So it depends on uh -huh. breed. And, and the breed specific size. is amazing to me. There's a dachshund rescue. There's yes. a what else? We have Gold Roddy Rescues, Golden Retriever. You pretty much don't have to worry about lab and pet rescues. There's so many of those that right. you can't get them in. But That's a lot good. of the ones you don't see around here, we can get out pretty quick. Right. And, of course, we're not talking about pure breed dogs. They Everybody, even take mixes. <laughs> <laughs> Every, they better because everything we get is a sometimes an unknown uh, history. And, yeah, it's, it's a mix. Yeah. I heard somebody call a, a, a hybrid it said, I yes. saw it for another shelter, it said adopt a hybrid. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. And then I saw that uh, recently they've started naming combinations like Chihuahua and Beagle. Is yeah. it Cheagle? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've got all kinds of new names we can put on our dogs, but basically yeah. um, they're just longing for a companion. Yeah. And our cats as well. We um, don't have a whole lot of information on our the animals that we have up for adoption sometimes. Yeah. Um, now, when you've selected a dog to go to a rescue group, what do you do then? Do you? Um... They have to be, um, we have what's called a CBA certification. Um, it stands for Canine Behavioral Assessment. We have to videotape those assessments. And it's basically seeing how they can be handled with their feet, their mouth, their whole body, mm -hmm. um, testing them with food, toys, and raw hides. Mm -hmm. And um, if they do pass that, then they then go from there to getting all the medical stuff done. They get rabies shots, heartworm tested, okay. um, heartworm preventative, and get health checks done. So if they, the temperament and the behavior is, I think I've seen you do a little bit of that, and you, you do things like put a bowl of food down, mm -hmm. and then... We have a fake hand that we'll put in there and push on their face to see if See they if they're food aggressive all. or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And these are not behaviors that make them unadoptable. It's no. just that the rescue groups... It's better have a certain to know. criteria. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That they want to know. Right. And you can know if they're better to go with kids or adults or what they would be more adoptable to. And I think you've had like people walk in the room to see what the dog does. Yeah. People leave the room and see what 
Mm -hmm. The dog, if he's trusting the women cupcakes sometimes. on the counter yes. <laughs> at the shelter, then we know, he, you know, he, or if he just sits there obediently and waits, mm -hmm. that's, you just note all those behaviors and mm -hmm. then you sort of evaluate. Um, is heartworm still a problem in this county? It's a big problem. Is it? We have, I think we have approximately four to five dogs right now at the shelter in adoption with heartworms. And oh. it is treated, we treat that mm -hmm. before they are adopted out. Okay, and that, but that delays their adoption, doesn't it? Does it does not, we go ahead and put them in adoption mm -hmm. and a lot of people won't adopt them if they are heartworm positive, they're a little skeptical of it. Right. But we do treat them while we're there. We go ahead and start it, and if they get adopted, they'll finish it at home. If not, they'll mm -hmm. finish it at the shelter. Which is, is a totally preventable illness yes. in dogs. And most of us who um, take care of our animals the way that we should and are responsible pet owners, our animals won't get heartworms. Yeah. Um, it's those animals that are often strays. Yeah, and they oh. don't get their monthly preventative. Okay, so it, it's still a monthly dose mm -hmm. in the home it's a pill form? For um, they have pill or topical that goes on their back between okay. the shoulder blades. Okay, that's easy. Yes, uh, it's very easy. Yeah. Um, so it's a matter of these, a couple of strays that come in. Uh, I, I just can't believe that it, it's not eradicated, but I guess that um, that's a public education. Yeah, you see it more in the south with the mosquitoes down here. Okay, because so it's carried by mosquitoes. It's carried by mosquito, mosquito, mosquito bites them and injects it into oh, them. Okay. And understand that when they are undergoing treatment uh, at the shelter, uh, it is expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the dog is ill. The dog heart muscle is being taxed by the presence of these heartworms. Mm -hmm. And then the treatment is is fairly uh, strong. It is. Yeah. Um, and they have to be confined a bit. For about four weeks after the treatment, they have to be confined to a kennel where the heart rate cannot get okay, put up. Okay, so a small area, so no mm -hmm. physical exertion. Yeah. Okay, is that what they're trying to avoid? Is trying to keep the heart rate down. The heart rate down, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Uh, well, I would just urge all our viewers to please use the heartworm preventative because it can kill a dog mm -hmm. and uh, we're fortunate that we catch it and are able to treat it. Mm -hmm. But if it goes untreated, it will It'll um, eventually be fatal them. to the animal. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we don't want that. It's a totally preventable disease like heartworms or rabies can e be easily prevented. So, yeah. um, but I do want people to know that when we have a dog with heartworm, we do treat it and bring it back to full health. And we've mm -hmm. done it many times and then ends up getting adopted. Yes. So uh, it's not necessarily, uh, should be a scary thing, but it's understandable someone wouldn't want to adopt a, a dog while it has it. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. Um, now, when you, um, in your work, you also help with our foster program. Mm -hmm. Now, why does the shelter need foster families or foster parents <laughs> <laughs> to take home dogs and cats for a short time? Why do we need that? We have puppies and kittens that come in that, with no mom, um, under six weeks of age. They have to be bottle fed or have to be fed special soft food until they are old enough to have vaccinations and eat hard food and go home with someone. We also have, like the other day, we had a cat that had kittens in the shelter, so we can't keep those in the shelter due to sicknesses, so we send those out to foster until they're old enough to be adopted out. Mm -hmm. And I understand she that, that cat you speak of, um, how did she come into the shelter? Was she it was a stray that got brought in. A stray, mm -hmm. okay, and then the next morning we... She got brought in on a late Friday night and she had the babies the next day. Oh, me. Um, it is quite an endeavor to take home kittens, and we do have a lot mm -hmm. of dedicated people that are on our list of fosters. What what do you look for in a foster? How does one become one? Um, anyone can become one. We encourage any volunteers that come in to at least try it and maybe start with an older batch of kittens or puppies or start with maybe an adult and try it, and then if they do like it, then we'll educate them and move them into doing some smaller animals if they feel comfortable with it. And um, just anybody that ever wants to do it, we are more than welcome to help them try and do it. And kittens, you'd have, obviously, when you're bottle feeding kittens, you'd have to have a little more time on your hands. Kittens have to be fed about every two to three hours. Wow. While they're little. Okay. So it's a lot of, basically like having a baby at home, waking oh. up in the middle of the night to feed them. Yeah, it sounds like it. And then, of course, older animals, uh, we might foster out if they've been in the shelter a while because mm -hmm. it gets the animal out of the kennel mm -hmm. and into a home environment 
and and we love it when they when it's a failed foster we yes. call it <laughs> we have those all the time yes we do. where instead of bringing it back for adoption they call and go i think i love it and yes. i'm keeping it <laughs> and that happens a lot doesn't it we had one just the other day <laughs> yeah um what would an adult like a, an adult cat why would an adult cat need a foster say um mostly the adult cats we send out have upper respiratory infection which runs rampant through the shelters when they get all the cats carry it when they get stressed out they break with it and it's basically like a human with a cold sneezing runny nose and runny eyes and it's very okay. contagious mm -hmm. so they'll get sent out to foster until they're better so if you notice those symptoms in an adult cat you mm -hmm. will try to get them out of the mm -hmm. go ahead and get the adult them out. cat area mm -hmm. because those illnesses even though they're not in the same kennels they, they sneeze and it travels across the room mm -hmm. and then everybody in their little area will get it will get it <laughs> yes, it's yeah, it, it is amazing that a cold is nothing for a human, yeah. but it's serious in a cat. Yes. It basically, you're saying an upper respiratory mm -hmm. for us. Uh, we shake those off in a day or two, yeah. but cats... They can carry it for weeks to months. Mm -hmm. And we want the cats to be able to socialize with the humans who volunteer in the cat room mm -hmm. and to go out on the cat porch. And if they are ill with this upper respiratory infection, um, how long do they usually stay at someone's home and foster? Um, anywhere from about a week to three to four weeks, just depending on if they're getting better or not. Um, I've had some fosters that'll keep them for three to four months because they want to make sure they're better and don't get mm -hmm. sick again before. Are they given back. the meds by our veterinarian to take uh, home? Yeah. Dr. Okay. Birch prescribes the meds before they go home and if they run out and they're still sick, they'll bring them back for a checkup and mm -hmm. see if they need more meds or not. Well, we're getting into kitten season since we're on the subject of, of cats. Um, we, ought, we have an influx of, of kittens every spring and early mm -hmm. summer. And the, the cat you mentioned that had kittens in the shelter is just the start of it. Yeah. Uh, so we will be needing a number of kitten fosters yes, <laughs> in the next few <laughs> weeks. Um, if a person is interested, should they just call you and, and chat with you at the shelter? Mm -hmm. Will you give them... Um, some guidelines and how to care for the animals yes, if it's their first time? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I would encourage our viewers, if you have an interest in becoming a foster for uh, cats or kittens or for puppies, because we have the same problem sometimes when a litter of small puppies is dropped off at the shelter. Um, and they, uh, we've had to bottle feed puppies before, <laughs> yes. too. So um, it, it is traumatic for a, a litter of, of kittens or puppies to be born and then instantly abandoned mm -hmm. or to be born to a stray or a feral cat is uh, mm -hmm. a cat that's not domesticated and oftentimes people find litters of kittens in their barn mm -hmm. and um, the only way to stop the cycle of those kittens having more is to remove them and mm -hmm. to have the um, cats spayed or neutered yes. before they're returned. And also, and it assures us that all those kittens will be spayed or neutered, so they will mm -hmm. not be part of the cycle. Yeah. Uh, so that's another pro, uh, part of what you do is um, basically trap, neuter, and release some of those cats that aren't the uh, house cats, but they are on people's property. Mm -hmm. And they can call us and let us know if they have that problem, can't they? Yes. Okay. Well, that'd be great if we could eliminate all these unwanted um, kittens and, and uh, puppies from being born, but we can't, so we try to do the best we can and we do depend on our fosters for that. We're going to take a little break and then we'll be back more to talk about the different rescue programs that Amber works with at the animal shelter. positive are you as a parent? Do you motivate your child by letting him know that he is loved and appreciated? Well, here's a fun quiz to help you measure your positive parenting. Now, for each of these questions, give yourself five points if it's something you usually do, and zero if it's something you never do, and then a score anywhere in between. Are you ready? Here's question number one. I compliment my child more than I criticize him. Number two, I tell my child I believe in him. Number three, I say I love you every day. Number four, I praise my child's effort when he tries hard, even if he fails. 
And number five, I remind him of his past accomplishments. How did you score? Well, if you scored 15 to 20, it means you're a pretty positive parent. Anywhere around 15 means you're average, and below that means you may want to try some of these ways to let your child know that you love them and appreciate them. Remember, stay connected. You're the vital link in your child's school success. I'm Joan Tidwell, and this is Parent Connection. Hello, and welcome back to Pet Watch. My guest today is Amber Mears, who's our rescue coordinator. And Amber, in the first part of the show, we mentioned several rescue groups and means of rescues that we do at the shelter. And one of them was Rescue Wagon. And I think our viewers might want to know that that is a PetSmart Charities program mm -hmm. that we applied for and were chosen for in late 2012, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in case people don't know, <laughs> explain to them why dogs can, can be moved successfully and adopted in certain northern states and down here we seem to have too many and why do they want them brought in in groups? They have um, strict spay and neuter laws up north and certain states have no tethering laws so they don't have stray dogs running around and litters of puppies so okay. their shelters are very low up there and they have a high demand for animals as people always want companion animals mm -hmm. and as they can't supply them for the people that live in the community, then they reach out to the shelters in the south that have no spay and neuter laws and have plenty of puppies to send up there. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we'll send about 15 to 20 dogs at a time and we group up with other shelters. Like yesterday we had two different shelters that loaded up before they came to us and then we loaded up seven on that transport. Mm -hmm. And they all travel up within two days and get up to their destination site and wow. we usually adopted within one or two days of Amazing. arriving. Amazing. And the, and the uh, adoption rates, the adoption fees are higher up there because Much demand higher. is so high. I've, mm -hmm. I've heard upwards of maybe close to $300 mm -hmm. at a public shelter for uh, certain dogs. Um, a rescue is an adoption and people need to understand that, that we uh, know that PetSmart Charities, which is a division of the PetSmart company, has a, conceived this great idea to take animals from shelters that are overflowing in the, in the southern states primarily. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that's because of the laws that you mentioned are, mm -hmm. are rather loose in the south and takes them to places like Wisconsin. Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Chicago are the three places we send them to. And when we talked about doing the behavior assessments, these are the videos that you take. Uh, they go to PetSmart, we send them, um, through the internet to mm -hmm. people at PetSmart, they look at all the dogs that you've assessed, mm -hmm. and then they contact you and say, we want... If um, they want them or don't want them. Okay, they'll or they eliminate know. one for some mm -hmm. reason. Um, anyway, th that one would stay with us and we would get it adopted. Yeah. But it is wonderful to know that two or three times a month, this transport pulls up and it's a large, a medium-sized truck or a, mm -hmm. a van, I've seen it, and um, it's already picked up some, and. Uh, there are kennels for every animal inside, and then you, you provide the medical certificates from our veterinarian. We have to have all medicals provided before they leave with a certificate. Okay, and then within a day or two, you said they're at their destination. Mm -hmm. I think one, sometimes they go to Chicago, Illinois, sometimes to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Okay. There are four shelters in Wisconsin that they go to. Wow, okay. That's wonderful um, to know that that dog is adopted. Basically, when it pulls mm -hmm. out of our, when the transport leaves our parking lot, uh, that dog will be adopted. Mm -hmm. So uh, someone asked me, how do you know? And I said, because PetSmart provides us with that they information. Provide, it's called a post-transport report and they send everything back to us. Great. Um, and that's just um, one less animal that we we need to find a home for mm -hmm. here. So any, it takes a village. I guess it takes the whole country sometimes. <laughs> I mean, we've sent dogs, lost dogs back to Texas and we've yeah. tra had them transported to Maine and all it, it's amazing what happens when um, someone's touched by a picture of a, a dog. Um, mm -hmm. We've had a couple drive down from St. Louis and adopt a, a coon hound one time yeah. because theirs had just died and they saw this one on um, Pet Finder mm -hmm. and came down and got it. Yeah. Um, so uh, those stories are great and we enjoy doing that every day. Uh, the rescue wagon is, has made an impact on our, our shelter and I think the figures for the first full year we were in the program 
was 2013. Mm -hmm. And through the PetSmart rescue wagon, you told me we sent 171, 171. dogs. Mm -hmm. And that PetSmart uh, transport happens to just take dogs. They only need dogs. Right. So that's um, a large number. It's great to mm -hmm. know. And I've, it, it's, it's fun when they come and everybody, it's all hands on deck. Everybody mm -hmm. get a leash and we parade the dogs out in the parking lot. Yeah say goodbye to them and, and they lick our faces and then they go to their new home and it's wonderful to know. Now there are other rescue groups you mentioned, some breed specific, mm -hmm. some want, there's one called Big Fluffy Dog, Big fluffy dogs. local that we work with a lot and that's what they love, Big Fluffy Big Dogs. Fluffy ones. <laughs> um, then we have Critter, uh, Critter cavalry. cavalry and they take a number of dogs mm -hmm. from us. So we have a list that you're familiar with when you see uh, dog or cat come in, you're familiar with all the different rescue groups. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, what did those other groups, how did that impact us? Uh, um, those other groups, we sent out 199 dogs last year. Wow. Okay, so almost 200 dogs went to other rescue groups, most of them in the, in the immediate in, in area. The Franklin, Nashville area. Okay. And then uh, 164 cats is yes, what. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So there are plenty of cat rescue groups and plenty of cat lovers um, in you said we work with our cats, we work with? Mostly um, we work with Proverbs and Fix Foundation and Fluff. Okay. They all take ours. And then some cats end up at uh, PetSmart? They do. Um, Fix Foundation works with um, Petco's in the Middle Tennessee area. Mm -hmm. So they'll send them out to all those different Petco's. Okay. And then um, the other two rescues will use PetSmart. And okay. you'll see if you go in PetSmart, they have the big glass windows with the mm -hmm. cages in there with adoptable cats. That's where those go to. Right. And sometimes we take dogs over to the local PetSmart in yeah. Brentwood on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. um, so people have an option to shop for dogs, which are not normally um, held for adoption at inside the PetSmart store yeah. here. So uh, we, we enjoy working with them. And that's good to know that sometimes the cats that are in there came started yeah. with us. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, what do you think other ways that people in the community can reach out and how can they help us with the things that you do other than becoming a foster? Um, as we get into the busy season with summer and we get overloaded with dogs or cats, if dogs are going to transport or something or specific mm -hmm. rescue groups, they can foster them for us until it's time for them to be transported or Okay. With cats, if we they just foster for a couple of weeks until there's empty kennels and adoption, it helps out a lot. So when you identify, say you identify eight eight dogs that are going to go on the next transport, mm -hmm. um, they're flagged. At, their kennels are flagged and they're removed from the adoption. Yes, ma'am. Public adoption area. So uh -huh. they go kind of at a holding area. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so the public is not. They're not looking viewing at them the and dog. wondering why they can't get that right? dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> you, when they get attached to one, you want it to be able to be adopted. Yeah. So you're constantly moving animals into different areas of the building that mm -hmm. the public may not see. Yeah. Yeah, but there are holding kennels that are just like the ones that are in adoption. Yes. Um, so that's good to know that you, you get your eight or ten lined up and get them all in one place. And then when the transport does come, it's... It's easier to do. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's go back to fostering for a moment because I think we're going to have a need for that. Mm -hmm. And if a person wants to foster uh, a cat, kittens, or puppies, yeah, uh, they probably already have a preference whether what, what they would like to do. Yeah, what they mm -hmm. like the best. Um, if I was a first-time foster, what would, advice would you give me? I would probably start with. Depending if you wanted puppies or adults or kittens or adults. Um, if you were starting out, go with something older that might be like five to six weeks old and only would need a couple of weeks and is already mm -hmm. eaten mm -hmm. at least wet food and could transition into hard food. And then as you got comfortable with that, then you can move down into the younger animals. And it's okay if you have other pets at home to be yes. a foster? Yes. Okay. Um, we, do, we do like, we like to tell you to try and keep them separated, maybe in a bedroom or a bathroom or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just easier that way, because we don't always know that they're not carrying something that we don't test for, and we would hate for mm -hmm. the individual animals to and infect that's, the household animals. That's something that I've learned, that the that kittens and puppies, sometimes you can't test them for everything. Yes. And certain illnesses don't appear 
you can't see some stuff you can't see for seven to 14 days. Okay, okay. So that's some of the things that you advise fosters to do. Trying and, to keep them isolated. And, and you're, you have fostered recently <laughs> Yes. a... I had a pit bull. Pit bull named had Presley. Nine puppies. <laughs> yeah. And she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then you took her home and put her in. I gr kept her in. Um, I have two garages, and I kept her in the garage that we don't use. Uh huh. And she stayed in there for, kept her for six weeks. And how many puppies, puppies did she have? We had nine. Okay. And they've all been adopted, I think. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Half went to Rescue Wagon, and then the other half were adopted through us. And one of our staff got one of yes. them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Presley, did. Mm -hmm. Is she still up for adoption? She's still up for adoption. Okay, okay. So mama's there, but all her babies are taken care of, and mm -hmm. she won't have any more litters because no, no. she's, she's now been spayed. spayed. <laughs> That's great, Amber. We, we, uh, it does take everybody to get these things done, and, <laughs> and it, and our staff does go above and beyond many times, and and that's just one example. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what April will be bringing here at the shelter. You know it's uh, going to be spring and April showers come and our theme for the month of April is it's raining cats and dogs and rainy days can be very quiet at the shelter and not many adoptions happen on those days. So we're going to do something unique. The adoption rate for each day in April will be reduced by the percentage of precipitation that's forecast that day. So if the weatherman says 30% chance of rain, all adoptions are 30% off that day. So you can see that the gloomier the day and the more rain we have, the uh, less expensive that adoption will be. It's just a way to bring awareness to the fact that there are ups and downs at the shelter and we like to keep uh, things moving and get people's interest up. And uh, on those gloomy rainy days, you'll actually have the uh, ability to save more money. So come in the shelter and uh, we'll have it posted that day what the percentage off is based on the rain forecast. We will also be having a number of community rabies clinics in April. They're all on Saturdays from 1 to 3. On April 5th, we'll be at College Grove, Fairview, Grassland, and Trinity Elementary, and Bethesda, Delhi, and Market. On April 12th, we'll be at Lipscomb, Hunters Bend, Longview, and Winstead Elementary, Centennial High, Hillsboro, and at the shelter at Cla on Claude Yates Drive. On April 19th, we'll be at New Nolensville, Chapman's Retreat, Scales, Westwood and Crockett Elementary, Page Middle and Franklin High, and then on the 26th, Edmondson, Oakview, Clovercroft, Walnut Grove Elementary Schools, Brentwood Middle, Independence High, and Fox's Grocery. We'll also be at the Franklin Main Street Festival with an adoption event on March 26 and 27, right in front of the County Archives Building at Five Points. So come by and see us there. And we will be continuing to prepare for the ASPCA Rachel Ray $100,000 challenge this summer during the months of June, July, and August. We will be competing against 10 other shelters of our size across the country, and you'll be hearing more about that. We're looking for uh, events to be booked right now in those months of June, July, and August. So if your business would like to hold an event during those months, or you would like to be a sponsor uh, of the contest and help us out, just call a shelter at 790-5590. And if you're thinking of adopting, go to our website, www.adoptwcac.org, and there you will see photographs and descriptions of all the cats and dogs that we have available. And if you want to be a foster, call Amber. <laughs> She's at the shelter every day. And again, the number is 790-5590. Amber, I want to thank you for being with us today and describing what a rescue coordinator does um, and it is a big job and we do depend on the public uh, in so many ways and all these different rescue groups and corporations that have such wonderful plans. Um, Amber's busy all the time I know and it's got to be fulfilling to see all those dogs and cats go into final homes and uh, lovable owners so we appreciate you being here. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Pet Watch and I hope you'll join us again next month. If I could talk to the animals Just imagine it Chatting with a chimp and chimpanzee Imagine talking to a tiger Chatting with a cheetah What a neat achievement it would be If we could talk to the animals Learn all their languages Maybe take an animal degree I'd study elephant and eagle Buffalo and beagle 
alligator, guinea pig, and flea. 